Hey guys, welcome to the Whitwam Organics Weekly Garden Report. My name is David Whitwam. I'm your host. We're truly coming to you live from the nursery in the rain. <laughs> I'm going to wait for this to calm down just a little bit. I'm not sure how well y'all can hear me actually in the nursery. It's pouring down rain. I was set up outside at my usual table, but that's exposed. And rather than going inside, I just came out here underneath the nursery. I'm not sure how loud it is, but this is probably not one of the best ideas I've ever had. My, my equipment's staying dry, so that's good. The nursery, uh, the nursery's working. The nursery plastic, keeping us dry under here. Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. We are truly coming to you live right now from the nursery in the pouring rain. So I apologize if it's a little bit loud. I think this is supposed to die down here in uh, maybe like five minutes. So, um, I mean, it's really, holy cow, it's really coming down. Good, because we need it. Rain's been skipping over us here in Tampa a little bit. With how hot it is, you get a couple days without rain, everything dries out real fast. Let's see how we're looking here. Yeah, this thing will be gone in just a minute. Facebook Live won't let me start super late, so I had to get started. I didn't want to have to reschedule it or miss out on it, and the window was closing. Yeah, it's going to slow down here in just a minute. I mean, I'm dry, but it's just, it's really loud. Can y'all hear me okay? I'll go ahead and start moving forward if y'all can hear me fine. Michelle, that looks like you logged in there. Can you hear me okay? Hey, Julia. How's the sound? It's raining really hard and it's really loud in this nursery. Okay, cool. Wow, I guess this microphone is working pretty good. So, again, welcome to the weekly Wilmot Organics Nursery and Garden Report. Um, today we're going to be talking about <laughs> today we're going to be talking about um, you know what, kind of when is it a good idea to plant with using seeds or to plant your garden using uh try logging out no the problem is is that's raining and it's really loud it's not my microphone um so as soon as the rain stops it, it won't be it won't be as loud um well today we're going to be talking about kind of when is it a good idea to use seeds uh to start your garden from seeds or start your plants from seeds and when is it a good idea uh, to my plants. I know we have a lot of customers that will contact us and we might have the exact thing that they're looking for in seeds and they might be right in the right time to plant seeds. Um, but a lot of people tell me that, no, I, I, I want to grow plants only. So we're going to go get into that a little bit and talk a little bit about uh, when is it a good idea, uh, like when do you need to buy plants basically and uh, like worse than any of the storms we've gotten so far, like the real storms. I love it out here, man. If it wasn't so loud and y'all could hear me good, I might do them all out here in the rain instead of being inside. But anyway, before I get into our topic today, um, we're going to get into our nursery report and our garden report. So um, I really want to tell you guys a little bit about uh, some of the stuff that we got grown in the nursery right now because I'm really excited about this time of year. Um, our stock keeps going up. Um, we're phasing out the summer stuff, which, you know, by now I'm kind of sick of anyway, and I know everybody else is too. However, some people like really, there it is, it's over. Some people really do miss the Malabar spinach over the winter time. God bless them. I'm standing in like three inches of water. <laughs> Um, 
So in our nursery right now, we have tons of African blue basil. Listen, you guys, if you've never grown African blue basil, this is a must have in your garden. African blue basil is a sterile basil plant that you do not have to keep tipped. It gets these beautiful flowers on it. It's one of the best pollinator attractors I have ever seen. Um, and you can cook with it. It has a wonderful smell. Um, it's just, it's just a really lovely plant. They get huge. You can trim it back. You can grow it from cuttings. You can share it with your friends. Um, I really recommend if you've never experienced this basil, get it. Now, speaking of our topic today, this is one that you have to grow uh, as a plant because you cannot, you cannot, uh, it's, it's a sterile plant. So there's no, there's no seeds to be had on that guy. Uh, we also have our African tree basil, uh, very interesting basil. Um, also called clove basil, I believe. Um, to me, it kind of smells like bubble gum or like old clove gum, I guess. Yeah. And um, it gets huge. I mean, the, the name is not, uh, the name definitely does it justice. I mean, ours over there that we cut back all the time is is about as tall as me. So that's the African tree basil. We have lemon basil. Um, perpetual, uh, perpetual spinach, which is actually a type of Swiss chard that's extremely heat tolerant. We've actually been growing that one all summer. Um, that's one of the plants that uh, that I have in my gardens year round. Um, it's definitely something that you can um, you can grow year round because it's cold tolerant, freeze tolerant, and heat tolerant. Hey, Laura, uh, growing conditions for African blue basil. African blue basil likes it hot. It really, really likes it hot. Um, I have not had to cover my African blue basil plants up for the past two winters here in Tampa. And there's been frost over on my neighbor's roof. So um, it's not freeze tolerant. If, if it's looking like it's going to get really cold, my advice is to take cuttings off of it, stick it in water, so you at least have something to replace it with if the cold weather wipes it out. Other than that, it does great. Okay, uh, so next. We have our cucumbers. I love our cucumbers. So the Soyu Nishikis and the Summer Dance cucumbers. Um, again, uh, we also have the Market More cucumbers. So the Soyu Nishiki cucumbers and the Summer Dance cucumbers, they're really good to plant now. And if it is, if it ends up being one of those years where it stays really super hot into November, you're gonna be really happy you planted these. If it cools off really fast, they start declining. They do not like the cooler weather. Like if we start getting in the 40s, they're not happy at all, which is why we also have the market more cucumbers. So the market more cucumbers, they do really well in the cooler weather to the cold weather. And the uh, summer dance and Soyo Noshiki do really well in the hot weather to the warm weather and, and a little bit in between. Um, so usually to have a, a continuous long cucumber harvest, I plant all the varieties. Um, we have uh, tons of Coreopsis, like six different kinds, all Florida natives. Uh, Glorioso daisies, uh, ducket dill, dotted horse mint or bee balm, and then we also have our eggplant. So we have the Florida market eggplant, which is a Florida heirloom, the good old black beauty, uh, Chinese bride. That's one of my favorites. It's the long, thin, uh, white one. Looks like it got spray paint with a little bit of purple or pink paint. Uh, Gallardia, formerly known as a Florida native. Um, Old Field Goldenrod, Jicama. So this is your absolute last chance to get jicama in and do really well with it. You can put jicama seeds in pretty much any time of year. Um, they're not freeze tolerant. They will produce some over the uh, winter time, but if you get the starts in that we have right now, you'll get a decent uh, jicama harvest before fall. And then I always leave one or two of the tubers in the ground and then they'll re-sprout in the spring and you'll get a large harvest from those in the summertime. Next page. Wow, and just like that, it was over. Milkweeds. We have swamp milkweed, horold milkweed, um, both Florida natives. We also have Vietnamese mint. Um, we have three kinds of okra. It's also, if you, if you like okra, if you want more okra, if you missed your chance on okra, it's not too late to plant okra, but I would definitely recommend plants at this time. That's a little teaser to our topic. Greek oregano, 
are uh, giant red, old-fashioned, Florida friendly pintas. Um, these get huge, folks. They get really, really big. They can be grown from cuttings. These aren't your little dwarf pintas that you buy at Home Depot. These are nice, big, beautiful plants. They have gorgeous red flowers on them year round. I also really recommend getting some of uh, these pintas in your garden if you're trying to attract pollinators. We also have big red peppers, California peppers, habanero peppers, jalapeno peppers, Thai bird peppers. We have a little bit of roselle left. That's actually what's behind me right here. Um, I think most of these are sold, um, but it's it's if you want to have roselle for the uh, holiday season, you got to get it in the ground now. It's definitely way too late for seeds on the roselle front. So again, that's another little tease to our topic today. Uh, broadleaf sage, tropical salvia, uh, Malabar spinach. Malabar's, I'm not going to bring it over here. Malabar is behind the camera. Um, Desert Zucchini. So our Desert Zucchini is an F1 hybrid. Um, I try and get as much open pollinated stuff in for you guys um, so that if you choose to uh, go down the road of growing your crops and, and, and saving the seeds for your next year, I want you to be able to do that. Some things just have so many problems that a good method of pest control is is gravitating into a hybrid that will um, alleviate that pest issue. And one of the biggest issues uh, with the zucchinis and yellow squash is powdery mildew. So our desert zucchini is a powdery mildew resistant variety. Um, it is so powdery mildew resistant that if we don't have a super cold winter, I've actually grown it all winter. Normally, even if everything is perfect, the super short days of December will wipe out your squash plants uh, with from powdery mildew. We have the Ahubak uh, Korean squash. I know in a lot of the gardening groups, there's been a good amount of talk about them. I highly recommend trying them. It's a vining plant. It's actually, um, make sure I get this right. Yeah, it's a C. mochata. Mosh mosh um, so it's more related to like a seminal pumpkin than it is uh, to a zucchini, which are C. C pepo. pepo. Um, I'm terrible with my Latin. I'm sorry, guys. But um, this one is a vining plant. It's also extremely resistant to vine borers. Um, it's fairly resistant to powdery mildew, and the zucchinis on it are phenomenal. Y'all, I think I grow this one year round as well. Um, just make sure you give it plenty of room to uh, sprawl out. I see everybody posting questions right now. Uh, thank you very much for that. I'll get to them in, uh, after I'm done with the nursery report before I get into the garden report. So we also have calabasa, uh, tropical pumpkins. Um, those are those are a Caribbean version of what the Seminole pumpkin is. Um, so basically they're all, they're all calabasa, but these particular ones that we have are more on the Caribbean side uh, down through Mexico. Uh, rather than the Florida Seminole pumpkin, which is a very specific sub cultivar of the greater Calabasa. Uh, common time. Our time is looking great. Um, oh, Michelle moved everything around. I don't know where the time is. I ain't got no time. Oh, there it is. There's our little time. We've got these new great little grow bags. We're trying to move as much stuff into them as possible. Um, but this also helps the soil dry out, which makes the uh, time a lot happier. Okie dokie. Um, Tia Bat Put Avocado Squash, which is also a seed muchata. Um, that's also grown as a zucchini, except for they're round. Um, and then, um, so we got into our squashes. Melons will be up soon. They're not for sale yet. Um, but all of our squashes, uh, well, everything but yellow squash. Yellow squash is almost ready. So most of our squashes are ready and up for sale. And then um, all of our more heat tolerant tomatoes are also online. So that would be our um, Florida Dade tomato, which is a determinant large slicing tomato. The homestead tomato, which is also a large slicing tomato, 
uh, also determinant. And then also determinant, we have Italian Roma tomatoes. And then we also have an indeterminate Roma tomato. So if you don't know the difference between a determinate and indeterminate tomato, basically the determinate tomatoes tend to put all their tomatoes out at the same time. And then um, are usually a more like short and stocky, uh, robust bush. And then your indeterminate plants will put out a continuous harvest. This isn't always 100% true. Um, I've seen determinants put out many flushes before. Um, so anyway, that's why we also have an indeterminate Roma tomato. So if you're looking for more of a prolonged, slower harvest throughout the season, we have both Romas, the indeterminate Roma and the determinate Roma. And then um, these are all heirlooms, by the way. And then another hybrid that we have is the Sun Gold Cherries. Now, the sun golds don't have any like huge, crazy disease resistant, but my goodness, if you've ever tried them, they're absolutely delicious. And uh, and that's why we have them, because they're sun golds. Enough said. So we also have the um, Sweetie, which is basically an heirloom version of your Super Sweet 100s. And then we have our yellow pear tomatoes, which is one of my favorites. Um, they're not the most disease resistant tomato out there. They are an heirloom. Um, the sweeties are an heirloom. Basically, everything I, I pointed out is an heirloom uh, as far as the tomatoes go. So that's the new stuff we have growing in the nursery right now. Um, keep checking back with us. This time of year, we'll be adding new stock to the nursery pretty much between now and March. Uh, we'll probably be putting new stuff online every single week because it just doesn't stop. You know, well, I mean, and then April, May, we'll be putting summer stuff online. <laughs> So the only time we kind of really slow down on putting new stuff online is right in the middle of the summer because we're not putting any more uh, spring stuff online and we already have all of our summer stuff up. So I guess that's why this time of year is kind of exciting for me because we're getting a lot of stuff up there that we haven't seen in a few months. So, <clears throat> so that's it for the, uh, for the nursery report. Let's see what you guys are. I think some people are asking some questions here. So. Uh, ba -dum, ba -dum. Michael Thorne says, my red stem alabar has polka dots. Yes, that's called frog's eye fungus, and it is not harmful to the plant. Uh, it's just kind of an eyesore, um, and you can just pick those leaves off, destroy them. I just eat them. There's nothing wrong with it. And then uh, Daniel Hayes says, as far as squash varieties that you carry, you know, Cala will say that caterpillar attacks some of my desert squash, and then I plant it a week later. The ones with you know, plant more started as a zucchini about a month ago. Caterpillars so started more, and these look like they're going to be good. Yeah, sometimes, and we'll get into that, Danielle. Sometimes it's just about timing, and you'll get it down pat on on really when when that timing is. So even though I grow the desert zucchini all summer, that's usually uh, from I'm not I'm not harvesting desert zucchini all summer because I don't plant any more between about, I'd say mid June until like now. So whatever plants we have in um, that are already growing, um, I, you know, if they make it till now, then, and you're putting more plants in right now, then you're basically growing it year round. Um, but there is a big gap uh, usually in production because we don't plant any more uh, right in the middle of the, in the peak of the summer. So let's get into the garden report. Um, so this year, um, I'm not sure how long all of y'all have been with me, but we used to have this awesome corn called uh, baby bonus corn. And uh, real short, nice plants. Um, they only got about four or five feet tall. And each plant produced uh, one to three absolutely delicious uh, white sweet corn. Um, the the corn was a little shorter than normal, but it was fast. It was 60 days. 60 days from seed, you'd get your corn harvest. And being shorter plants, they also uh, didn't deplete your soil as much. Um, so they didn't take up a bunch of real estate. Your soil wasn't shot out. Well, the grower um, that I was working with, he stopped uh, growing. I think it was, a, it was COVID. And then basically once he ran out of seeds, um, that was it, and the supply is done. So, um, the uh, 
thing I wanted to announce is in about four or five of my gardens right now, I'm testing out. Uh, oh, and the, the bonus baby corn was also an F1 hybrid meaning you couldn't save the seeds and get the same thing. So I've been searching and searching and searching for new corn. Um, and this year I'm testing out two new varieties that are both like super old um, heirloom varieties uh, that didn't really make it in the market for any other reason other than kind of the shape of the corn. So they look funny. But apparently they taste really good. Now, I'm, I'm just now trialing them. So we're going to see how, if I'm successful with these corns in the spring, we'll have them up online and for sale. Um, and then I'm also playing with a, um, a blue corn that would be uh, like old Aztec blue corn that is for uh, making blue uh, corn flour. And then I'm also playing with three different types of popcorn. So we'll see. Um, I've got them planted out all over the Tampa Bay area. And, um, you know, we're, we're trying to just trial them, see how they're doing with the pests, see what the production is like. Some of the garden beds I like heavily fertilized with organic fertilizer. Some I was did a little bit lighter. So we're just trying to kind of see what they do. Um, and then if, if all it's all good, we'll be releasing these uh, these varieties uh, for sale in, in the spring. So I'm really excited about that. Um, another thing I have to report is... Um, I don't know if I've really ever said this on one of the live shows, but um, right now, three times a week, I'm at different community gardens in the morning. And all three community gardens around the Tampa area take volunteers. Um, so Tuesdays, I'm at a garden in Ybor City from around 9 to 11, maybe 9.30 to 11. On Wednesdays, I'm at a garden in Sulphur Springs from... Uh, from 9.30 to 11. And on Fridays, I'm at a garden between uh, about 9, 9.30 and 11 or 11.30, and that's out by USF. So if you're interested in getting the addresses for those, um, you can go on the website and under calendar of events are each of those gardens that we take volunteers at. So if you wanna work side by side with me, if you've got gardening questions, if you wanna just learn from what we're doing in the garden, I mean, literally you could come to these gardens every single week and go home and just duplicate what you did in the garden that day and you're gonna be successful. So, um, you know, my big announcement is we're getting a great flush right now from of USF students at my garden on uh, on Wednesdays. I'm really excited about that. It's great to see those uh, young faces and they're all excited and learning about gardening and helping out. It's just, it's a really great experience. And then the garden on Friday has been um, up by USF. Uh, that one's been cranking for a while. We, we have a great group of volunteers, regulars. Um, we get a nice steady influx of new people. That one's really exciting. And then the one in Ybor City is kind of, you know, how can I say it? Like if you showed up, it might just be you and me. <laughs> that one's um, kind of, you know, puttering along. But uh, that's what happens with some of these projects is they kind of ebb and flow. Um, and we just try and keep them going as, as best we can. So I hope to see you guys at one of those gardens that's uh, you know, around 930 on uh, Tuesdays, Ybor City, Wednesdays, Sulphur Springs, and Fridays at USF. Again, you can grab those addresses if you go on the website under calendar events and go to that day of the week and click on it the address is under there and um and uh or you can contact whitlam organics on our facebook page for more information um we have a couple of gardens right now that still have collard greens in them um that are doing really well in most of our gardens that had collard greens the harlequin bugs showed up and and we pulled them out um in those beds that we planted corn we have and some of them already planted uh the tatame squash and we're about a week or two away from planting some beans. Um, and those are growing really well. Our long beans and our okra is just cranking right now. I'm trying to decide, um, you know, when am I gonna pull this stuff out and move on to something else? Right now, I still have empty beds that we're turning over and putting new stuff in. Um, so as long as I have space in the gardens, I'll keep the summer stuff in. But as soon as I need that real estate, if it's something we've been eating for a few months or six weeks and, and we need that real estate, that stuff's coming out and we're moving on to the next thing. And that actually segues us right into our topic for the day. But I saw a bunch of people asking some questions. So before we get into the topic, 
let me just uh i don't want these going too far back so Lori says i bought the carrot seeds from you and they are not transplanting very well right now they keep dying should i sow them directly in the raised bed instead well we'll talk about that Lori. so carrots do not transplant at all those are definitely a, something that gets straight seeded um, if you go on the website, you will never see any root crops for sale as live plants because we sell them as seeds only. I would never do that to you. So um, anything that's a root crop, I always recommend straight seeding. That was a good question because it like segued us right into the topic. <clears throat> Danielle says, seriously, this is nature. I don't care how they look. Actually, that's beautiful. I just want to eat it. <laughs> yes, they are really good. Um, the desert zucchini. Stephanie says, Corota carrots, try direct sowing them. Uh, protect the young seedlings from storms if you can so they don't drown. Oh, y'all are talking amongst yourselves now. Yes, that was the name of them. Okay, thank you. I'll try that. You know, Lori, I'm actually glad you even got them to germinate. They do have one of the higher germination temperatures of any of the carrots that we stock. It's like 78 to 80 degrees, but sometimes it's just too hot still to even germinate them outside. So, um, a lot of times I have to wait for it to cool off just a little bit. Like, actually, if I would have had some in the beds um, last night, they would have probably started germinating this morning because it was a little bit cooler this morning. Stephanie says she bought some and did well. And then Danielle says, speaking of carrots, all the tops of my carrots from you got eaten off. And, well, I'm like, it's a root vegetable, so hopefully okay. They might regrow their tops the thing is is just keep trying it we got a nice long season in front of us um to plant those seeds in succession um you know and if you're not successful with run around plant another round in a couple weeks and then plant another round in a couple weeks because even if you have those carrots and you weren't planting in succession your successful succession planting one which, there's another video before this one on succession planting one of the methods of succession planting is planting the same thing over and over and over again so if you were going to plant x amount of something then you would initially only plant a quarter of x of something and you would do that four times at spaced intervals otherwise you're going to have all that stuff at the same time and then you're going to have nothing so that actually does kind of get into um our topic today of when um whether or not to use seeds or um or plants so let's talk about the pros and the cons and i think you know, the first one that's really, really obvious um, for a pro for seeds and a con for plants is I, the most obvious. Seeds are cheaper. Plants are more expensive. So here at the nursery, this little pack of okra right here is going to cost you five bucks. That's four plants. For $3.75, you'll get a whole pack of seeds. They'll probably grow like 60 plants. So 60 plants versus four plants, and the plants are more expensive. Okay, so that's one of the downsides of plants and one of the upsides for seeds. Let's see if we can keep score. So another one of the um, upsides to seeds and downsides to plants, variety. Okay, if you can get into planting seeds and know when to plant them and get comfortable with it, you, your whole world is open as to what varieties you have available. I mean, even here in the nursery, we always have a limited supply of stock and um, of plants. So we don't have everything in our catalog growing at the same exact time. And, you know, as you get into other nurseries and less specialized nurseries, that, that variety shrinks more and more and more and more. Um, you know, I try and keep variety. I try and have three, four, five kinds of broccoli for you, three, four kinds of okra for you. Most of the time when you're buying plants, you got maybe if you're buying tomatoes, two, three, four varieties of tomatoes, and that's the one with the most, right? Maybe two kinds of peppers, maybe, you know, there's one kind of broccoli, that's it. You go to the, you go to the big box stores, you're, you're buying broccoli, you're not buying a type of broccoli. And one of the things that I found is all the way from your timing during the year to your microclimates, to what the weather's gonna do this year, to what the bugs are gonna be like, what varieties you have going makes all the difference. So, um, you know, if, if you're planting multiple varieties of the same thing side by side, that's the only way you're going to prove that to you. That's the only way that you're going to figure that out and what works when. 
if you keep only planting the same kind of cucumber or one kind of cucumber at a time, then you're never going to see all the caterpillars show up and only eat this one kind. Or if you're only planting one kind of squash, you're never going to see this one get riddled with powdery mildew and the other ones get left alone. Okay, so you're always going to think that it was the powdery mildew's fault and not the fact that you had the wrong variety in of that plant at the at the right right variety at the wrong time wrong wrong variety at the wrong time that would be a double negative it would mean you have the right variety but um you know your timing might be off maybe it just doesn't work for your area i mean there's some of my favorite varieties of stuff that we grow and i've tried to grow them over and over and over again for certain uh clients in their garden it just doesn't work it just doesn't work so we've moved on to other things that work better so you know when you're talking about tomatoes or broccoli or cucumbers or okra each of those there's many many varieties out there so that could kind of bring us to the um i still think you're saving money but um you know you could technically go to a nursery and buy a lot more variety um of stuff um and and just go and go plant your garden i'm kind of jumping around but i was trying to talk about the, the benefits to the seeds so with seeds it's it's about variety so also timing so if your timing is off your timing is off that's a you problem okay it's not a seed problem so if you have seeds you can plant them whenever you want to um so you're way more open to experimentation um, you're way more open to, once you get it down pat, to being on time, um, whatever that might be. And we'll get a little bit into the actual planting of the seeds. That's not what today's topic's about. Um, some of that stuff might come up in the questions, but I'll cover a little bit about a few different planting of seeds techniques and the pros and cons with them. But that's not what this video is about, but I will touch upon it before I'm done. If I don't, remind me to. Um, so timing. So you can plant them whenever you want. With plants, if you're relying on plants, you can only plant them when I got them, when the box stores got them. So you're very limited on timing, okay? Um, I think that's about it with the pros on the seeds. There might be some more. Um, they all kind of go with the value but I'll still point them out it's a it, these are these are still value based which was the first one so we had mentioned the succession planting so anything that grows better in succession planting where you got to you know plant some wait a couple weeks plant some wait a couple weeks and plant some so some examples uh, would be well anything that's short lived so like green beans bush beans I don't care how nice you are to those plants and you do everything right. They peter out after four to six weeks, eight weeks tops. And then by then, like they're barely producing anything. So they might flush out two, three, four good harvests for you. So, but the season form is a lot longer than that. So if you plant a couple rounds of them four or five weeks apart, then you'll get a longer harvest of beans throughout their entire potential season. We already mentioned carrots. So carrots would fall under that category of they're not cut and come again. So cut and come again plants or plants that you continuously harvest off of throughout the season, that would be like tomatoes, okra, kale, collards, any of the leafy greens, broccoli once it starts flushing out the uh, side shoots. Those are all plants that you can continuously pick at and harvest on throughout the whole season. So anything that's not cut and come again, so that would be any of your head crops. So cabbage, Napa cabbage, bok choy if you're not picking off the leaves, any root crops, carrots, beets, they're one and done. So those are all things that you're going to want to plant in succession. Um, a lot of lettuces i found do better, even if you're picking at the leaves as a leaf lettuce, it's still stressful to the plant. So I prefer to only do that a little bit and then harvest the entire lettuce before it bolts and get bitter, gets bitter. That's way easier to do if you've already planted more and you've got some that are almost ready if it's your only few lettuces because you bought a four pack sitting in your garden you're going to keep picking that thing and picking that thing until it bolts and gets better so having seeds available and learning how to use them allows you to plant more in succession the reason why i said that's more value 
related is because obviously you can still do that with plants, but it's going to cost you an arm, and an arm and a leg. Oh, well, I just mentioned it and in the beginning, and I'll mention it again. Some things just don't transplant well. And that would be almost all of your root crops. And I'm saying almost all because, oh, some pollen is out here. So it's driving me nuts. <sighs> Sorry, I'm playing with my nose. Um, but um, I said some root crops. I've actually had decent success with like turnips, uh, transplanting turnips. I've had good success with transplanting beets. So I've started all of those early. I've considered bringing those into the nursery, but they really have such a short shelf life, short shelf life in these packs that at some point, if uh, if we don't sell them, I'll be selling something that's root bound and you don't want your root crops root bound. But on a personal level or in my community gardens, if for some reason we're trying to get a jump on the planting, I will plant root uh, like uh, beets and turnips and radishes. Those are that's the other one in uh, plug trays or in small containers and transplant them out into the garden. So an example of when I would be doing something like that would be um, I'm, I'm full. I don't have any space for stuff, but I want to go ahead and pre start some of the seeds of those root crops. Um, because I know I'll be harvesting something out of the garden and I'll have some real estate opened up in the, um, you know, in the coming weeks. So I want to get a head start on getting those seeds going instead of waiting to harvest and get the real estate and then putting the seeds in. So that would be an example. So, so some of the um, pros of planting using plants, the, I think these are pretty obvious, but um, typically you're getting a stronger plant. And it's going to produce sooner okay here's the dealio and i'm being a terrible salesman saying this stuff as i'm standing in my nursery surrounded by plants that i need to sell okay if you're on time you can throw this out the window if you're on time for planting then this really doesn't matter but if if you get plants and i think this is fairly obvious you're going to harvest sooner. Okay. And sometimes harvesting sooner can mean more of a prolonged harvest because when do we stop harvesting? When it dies, when does it die? Usually because of a weather change. So we don't know when those weather changes are coming, but we know they're coming. Right? So it's fairly obvious that if you can get your stuff producing sooner, then you're going to have more harvest off of that plant, off of that square footage in your garden space. So other advantages, um, it pays my bills. Now, seeds pay my bills too. So whether you're getting seeds from us or you're getting uh, uh, plants from us or um, getting your uh, plants and seeds somewhere else and getting fertilizer from us or plant seeds and fertilizer from someone else and tuning in, I still appreciate you. But um, the biggest benefit i think to the plant and this is kind of how we try and plant and keep stock and what 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 we try and keep stock of here in the nursery things are a little harder to start so some of these herbs um herbs take forever to start by seed and then things that people would typically be late for and at least that's what that's where i started at doing this and as the business has grown and more people have expressed interest because i i'm a seed peller i'm always trying to peddle seeds off on people but my customers turn down the thumb screws because they want plants so we're having more and more plants available even though you might be right on time to plant seeds so I used to try and lag it up a little bit so that most of my stock was everything that you should be planting by transplants right now if you still wanted it in your garden, but you were too late for seeds. So that's kind of how this was born and, and why I was able to run this business in such a small space, which we're outgrowing very quickly and hopefully we'll be in our own space here in the next two to four months in a bigger space. Because y'all, I'm in my backyard and this is it. Like 
don't know if I've ever shown you guys this, but like that is Whit Walmart Organics, guys, right there. There you go. That's it. That's the whole thing. Three tables. So we run all this on those three little tables. Um, so anyway, that's what I always tried. So we're always going to have stock of plants for people who are behind. So let me, let me, let me just, let me get a direct translation here. So, so basically if it was October and you're just planting your garden, you should probably be thinking about tomato plants and not tomato seeds. If it's March, you should probably be thinking about tomato plants and not tomato seeds. So as far as timing goes, being able to uh, buy plants can help you out if you're late on planting certain things and then keep you right on time. So normally if you say had somebody who was growing their garden from seed and they were right on time and you buy the right plants at the right time because you're late, in a week or two, once everything's established, you shouldn't be able to tell the two gardens apart. So basically it just brings your garden up to speed faster so that you're right trucking along with everybody else during the right season. Um, there's not too many other pros that I could think of as far as buying plants. Um, well, okay, there's one. I And I already mentioned it, but I, I wasn't specific about it. The other big pro that I think I hear most is people just aren't comfortable with seeds. So they, they scare them because they probably killed some stuff. Um, and so it's just easier to buy plants and plant them. Um, so, you know, that's, that's definitely a big pro. I like, I get it. That's how you feel. The bottom line is that that's not reality. What and so what I usually invite people to do is if, you know, they've been a consistent customer and I keep seeing them buy plants is it, on some of the stuff that I know that they're right on time for, I, I try and also sell them some seeds. So if you're kind of trying to transition off of um, just buying plants, what I would invite you to do is, you know, wean yourself off. Go ahead and buy the, those plants and buy a pack of seeds. And so like, let's just say that you were going to do eight of our desert zucchini plants, which by the way, we have six, four packs online right now five dollars each that's right Whitwam organics videos are brought to you by Whitwam organics that's our sponsor so I, that's why i get to plug my business but um if you were going to buy eight squash plants from us i would invite you to buy four by one four pack and a pack of seeds so buy your one four pack and then um plant those seeds in the other four spaces and just see how you do um you know that actually brings up another another benefit of seeds over plants is um the odds are more in your favor right and what do i mean by that is if you buy four plants and something happens and four of them die or two of them die you now have two plants right so with seeds, because they're so inexpensive, you can put two or three seeds in each hole. Um, I usually don't do that anymore on stuff. What I've learned to do is space them out some. Because if you are going to dig them up and transplant them, say they all come up, it's not as hard on the plants if the roots aren't all intertwined. So let's say if you wanted four zucchini plants, and so you were gonna plant eight seeds, two seeds in each hole, I've actually just started planting like two and I put the other one like six inches away from it. And then I put two, six inches away from it. And then that way, if in another spot, like let's say, cause this happens sometimes in one of the four spots, neither seed comes up, then I'll go dig up one of these and move it over. And I wouldn't have disturbed the one that was next to it. So that's why I don't put, especially big plants like seeds and tomato or, or squash and tomatoes, I don't put them in the same hole anymore. I spread them out. And then that way I can dig them up and move them around if I need to. Okay. 
So remember, seeds are cheap. You get more diversity with the seeds, more availability. Um, you have more flexibility with your timing. Um, plants are great because if you are uncomfortable with seeds, they're available. If you're behind on your garden, they're great to just throw in and get caught up. So there isn't a straight answer about which one is better. They really have their place. So if you are new to gardening, like do both. I've told people this and I'll keep telling people this. It's not only hilarious, but it's absolutely true. The biggest difference between a novice gardener and an expert gardener is, let's see if anybody knows the answer. <laughs> so the difference between an expert and a novice gardener, y'all, who's going to try and answer the question before I do? I'm going to answer it in five, four. There you go, Corey Elko, you get the prize. And the prize is, I tell you, you get the prize. So that's right, an expert gardener has killed more plants. So get comfortable, you're gonna kill things, especially in your annual vegetable gardens, okay? Like even if you do it all correctly, this stuff's gonna die. That's what it does, that's why they're annuals. So. As you get better at it, you just get more produce off the plants before you kill them or before the weather kills them. So, you know, I kill in my annual vegetable garden just as many plants as someone who is not successful. Well, unless I planted more plants, then I kill more plants. So the more plants you plant, the more plants you're going to kill because they're all going to die. Um, that's that is the nature of the vegetables and fruits that we're mostly working with here at Whitwam Organics. So if you're looking into perennial stuff and food forest stuff, there's tons of people out there who are really specializing in that for Central Florida. Um, we're creeping into some of that stuff, but I'm actually moving away from the edibles, more into the Florida natives um, and the flowers and stuff for the pollinators and for people to be able to re replace their landscape with uh, Florida natives. So those are probably the only perennials we're really going to get into. Um, but if you are looking for more of a perennial garden, there's definitely resources out there and you're more than welcome to reach out and we can point you toward those resources. Here at Whitwam Organics, our focus is the turnover type fruits and vegetables for an annual vegetable, fruit and vegetable garden. Okay. Um, that pretty much wraps it up, guys. I, I can keep walking around. Oh, oh, see, y'all didn't remind me. I wanted to talk a little bit about a couple different methods of planting the seeds and a couple of the pros and cons about it. I could do a whole entire episode on this. So method number one, seed trays. The things I'm surrounded with but can't find any right now. Here's one. So a seed tray. This is a seed tray. They come in all kinds of different sizes. You just fill it with your little mix and you plant your plants. So like this could be your whole entire garden right here, you know, um, and then you pop the stuff out and you transplant into the garden when it's ready. So seed trays, that's method, method number one. Part of that method. So method 1A, seed trays outside. So seed trays outside with some sort of protection. So we got a little bit of shade cloth up right now. And then we're under a plastic roof to keep the pounding rain off. So method 1B is seed trays or seed containers, you know, pots, Dixie cups, paper towel rolls, whatever you got laying around, indoors with grow lights. Don't try and put them in a window unless you know it works. If you try and put them in a window just, you know, for the first time for an experiment to see if it is enough light, listen, if it isn't, three, four hours of light, it's probably not enough light. You should be taking those things outside for a walk every day. So even if you have a grow light or a window that gets okay sun um, and you can at least two, three days a week, take them out for some good dappled light morning sun, um, they're gonna do a lot better and not come in as leggy. So leggy plants can, you know, they're not good. So those are your two seeding methods. Most seed packets, y'all, when they're giving times to plant, 
it says on the packets plant indoors okay so i wish it would say plant with protection because you don't have to start your seeds indoors this is there's another option and that's outside where they're going to come into their own in the environment or close enough to it where you're going to be transplanting those plants and um here outside we have solar powered grow lights well one we have one giant solar powered grow light and um it doesn't take any batteries or electricity in fact it produces power so your next method is planting yeah michelle james the indoors is meant for northerners right so a lot of the information and wording on seed packets is geared toward people who live other places i've talked about this in multiple episodes we are a tiny speck on the market of these people who are selling everywhere so why would their wording make sense to us down here in florida but i just wanted to point that out that when a packet says start indoors that just means protect it from the elements during the springtime that means protect it from frost and um you know back before i had this cover out here and we would get frost i wasn't coming out here covering up my my seed trays my, i mean i have these little plastic domes that i will put over them but you know worst case scenario i've got 10 or 20 let's say even worse than that 30 trays of plants that for that one night i'll drag under the carport or drag into the office or drag into the laundry room and then I'll bring them back out the next day. So the one, two, three nights that you got to actually worry about the cold, you got your entire garden in these tiny little trays. It's really easy to bring it in. So I just, I don't understand why people grow stuff inside for eight weeks with grow lights, just because of a few nights of, of cold weather, just bring them in. I do understand a little bit more if you don't have a covered space and you're trying to get an early start on your fall garden in the summer with these pouring rains i get that that makes sense it doesn't make any sense to me in the springtime in the late winter springtime grow them outside people they need as much sun as they can get corey elko apparently virginia is the south that's right florida is the only state that you have to go north to get to the south it's my little dad joke for the day so um the other method of planting your seeds is direct seeding so you can direct seed them straight into the garden where you're going to put them um if they're good seeds and the temperature's right most seeds should germinate within a week maybe a little bit more than that so if you if, they, if the stuff doesn't come up plant more seeds you know you get a whole pack of seeds got thousands of seeds in it for some of the stuff or 20 seeds or 30 seeds you only need one, two plants a season for certain things. And then, you know, maybe 20 plants of something else, like a lettuce or a bok choy, depending on how much you eat. Spinach, maybe 30 plants, depending on how much you eat. And you got a lot of seeds. So plant more seeds. If the stuff doesn't come up, don't wait too, too long. Um, so straight seeding, I kind of talked about um, my method, my new favorite method of, like, if it's squash, something that should be kind of far apart, instead of putting two seeds in this hole and two seeds in this hole, I'll put a seed here and in between the two, I'll put a seed there and a seed there. And then that way, if I need it, if I need somebody for somewhere else, I can dig it up really easy, transplant and not mess with the roots of the ones that I'm leaving behind. For things that I can eat the baby plants of, okay? So broccoli, Swiss chard, spinach, lettuce, kale, right? The list goes on and on. Anything you've ever seen in a microgreen mix or a spring mix, okay? This is my plant, my new planting method whatever the planting depth is for the seeds it's a half of an inch i stick my finger a half an inch in the dirt and i draw a line all the way down the bed for the entire row that i want to plant and i sprinkle the seeds in a lot like this is like like i do carrots and i sprinkle the seeds in so that they're depending on the size of the plant you know maybe anywhere from like a few millimeters apart to maybe a quarter inch apart and then as the plants grow I come in and I start thinning the plants out with scissors and I get a harvest. 
And what this does when you're doing an intensive planting like that of your seeds, so let's say it's spinach, you read on the seed pack, it needs six to eight inches between plants, right? So if you put a seed in here and you go eight inches, you put another seed in or two seeds and you go eight inches, put another two seeds. Until those plants need that space, you are literally wasting that space in between the plants. If you drop the seeds in and as they grow and start crowding each other, you're thinning the plants out, you're using that entire space for baby greens the whole entire time. The other benefit to doing that, doing it that way is one of the best um, things to fight weeds is shade. So having more plants kind of tightly packed in there creates more shade. And basically, instead of weeding your garden, you're going in and you're pulling out plants that you get to eat. So when your plants need the space, you're not pulling out weeds. You're literally pulling out food. So by overplanting your garden with these greens and using it as kind of a ground cover, and then as the other plants and those plants need the space, it's almost like a negative planting. So when everything's said and done, if it's a plant that's a cut and come again style plant, like a kale plant, or even some of the spinaches I grow, or a leaf lettuce, by the time those um, plants need all that space, where I would start picking leaves off the plants, I've already been harvesting in between them. So I'll like leave this one and then eight inches later leave this one and then eight inches later leave this one okay and then once i reach the proper plant spacing through negative you know harvesting then i start picking the leaves off the ones that are left behind so before then i'm harvesting entire plants pull it, pulling out whole kale plants boom right into the food almost don't even have to um almost don't even have to cut it up they're so wonderful and tender so you know, obviously another method of straight seeding is follow proper plant spacing and put multiple seeds in each hole. And like I said before, I'm starting to gravitate away from that more and more. Um, so yeah, we'll go through the rest of these um, questions here and then I'm going to wrap it up. Danielle says she's got a huge garden and she's been legally blind for 16 years and people can't believe she's doing this. That's awesome. Heck yeah. Yes, Corey, you missed the garden report again. All right, Patty says, I just planted my squash, zucchini, eggplant, cauliflower, etc. two days ago. Um, I use the soil I purchased from you and notice it's so light that if I water, I notice it floats. Any tricks to this? Um, I mean, this is the same stuff. This is the same stuff. So you walk when you first put your seeds in you got to water it lightly and very slowly until it becomes saturated so once it's good and saturated at least once it holds together much better yes straight out of the bag it's extremely light because it's totally dried out because the pro mix does come with mycorrhizae spores in it so it can't get wet until you use it so yes it is extremely light but the other thing too is don't fill your containers up all the way leave a space so that way too, if your stuff, cause we have, we, we do have stuff out, out from under the cover, you know, and sometimes stuff gets left out. If there's a pouring rain or something and this was left out and you had different seeds in each one and you had filled this up all the way, then they can wash into the other ones. You won't know what's what. If you leave a gap, then they'll at least be in the spot where you left them. Okay. So don't fill your containers up all the way. Make sure you leave space lightly water them in like multiple times until you feel like the soil is saturated and that takes care of that problem. Patty says, how often should someone purchase new seeds? Different seeds have different lifespans. So, you know, here, 
we're constantly buying new seeds because we're selling them. Some things kind of lag behind. So we've had seeds that, um, you know, if we have older seeds, um, we will germinate, test them first. Because often when people are starting to buy certain types of seeds, um, we're planting it the same time anyway. So if, if we're unsure about the age of our seeds, we'll do a germination test first. We'll plant a whole tray of something and then look at the percent. And if we're under 80%, we take them offline. We only use those seeds in the nursery. And then we buy new seeds um, and get new seeds in um, to, uh, to sell to you guys. The um, Really, if your seeds start going bad, but they're still germinating, but just poor germination, then you just plant more seeds. So, if, you know, you kind of math it out if you wanted, um, if you wanted eight uh, plants and you're getting 50% germination, then you'd need to plant at least 16 seeds, right? Maybe a little bit more. <clears throat> so as your seeds go bad, you can just plant more seeds because seeds are cheap. But I, to answer your question more directly, I've had some seeds start to kind of decline in a year to two years, and some of them I've seen them last way longer than that. It also really depends on how you store them. So any of the seeds that we're storing long, long term, we store in the refrigerator in sealed bags. So Lori says, yes, screen rooms. So, you know, I've seen people's lanai's that are more like a pool enclosure that let in a pretty decent amount of light. But, um, you know, if you're talking about ones with the, like, the metal roof and the screen, sometimes those don't even get enough light um, to start some stuff. The key is just keep an eye on it. The stuff's coming in leggy. Like, get it in more light before it keeps growing leggy it's not going to stop growing leggy if it's growing leggy it's going to keep growing more leggy and then you're not going to have a healthy plant yes corey we are officially a week cl closer to the monthly seed subscription then michael thorne says i put my seed starter in a bucket and lightly moist in it First, before filling the seed trays, uh, then when you water, it soaks in. That's another method. Um, I found with some of the smaller seeds that we work with, but we're working with hundreds of seeds at a time. So we're it's a little different here. But um, to me, when you're planting a tray, a, a big tray, and your fingers are getting wet and stuff, then the seeds start sticking. And so some of the seeds are just so tiny. Um, I know I like to keep my workspace when I'm doing seeds completely dry. So I actually appreciate this, the, the potting mix being on the dry side rather than on the wet side. Um, so yeah, we also um, add a little bit of organic fertilizer to ours. So we definitely can't wet it way back then. Um, and like I said, our ProMix, we, we have to store it dry all the way up until when we use it. Because once it gets wet, some of the mycorrhizae spores could possibly crack open and start looking for a plant. And if there's no plant there for them, they'll die. And last but not least is my, gonna be my last question. So Lori says, near Tampa, when do we plant tomatoes? So we have tomato plants for sale right now, all of our heat, more heat tolerant ones. Uh, we're planting our Cherokee purples, beef steaks, and brandy wines uh, next week. And um, so either or you could get seeds right now for all the tomatoes. Um, that window is closing though, um, but you have a few weeks. You could do seeds now or you can do plants. Um, depending on where the weather swings, getting some plants in your garden right now might not be that bad of an idea um, because if the weather switches and starts cooling off a little bit early, more toward the early side of October, you're gonna have tomatoes way before everybody else. If it ends up being hot as hell until the first week of November, they might not be too happy. So right now it's a little bit of a gamble, you know, whether or not to put tomato plants in but anyway, it's definitely not too late for seeds. 
and I don't think it's too early for um, for plants. But if you're new to Florida gardening, or even if if you're new to Florida gardening, I'm going to give you some some good advice. If you've been Florida gardening for a while, you're going to be like, "Yep." Um, if you try and be right on time for everything, like right on time, like plant when you think it's the right time, you're always late. Period. The end of story. So we're always planting stuff where the plants aren't going to be super happy in the season prior so that you have more mature plants growing when the weather turns to where those plants are happiest. If you actually wait for that weather to get started on stuff, then you're going to be behind. So like, just think about this logically. Like if I told you that on either end of a season is going to be weather that could kill your plant or bugs that could kill your plant. Okay. Or just anything, anything undesirable, right? You got, you got two walls on both sides. Okay. And walls, not a good, that's not a good word. You got hills. Okay. A wall would be like, a hill's more like, stop. Okay. So if you were to lose plants and if you were to have trouble with plants, would you rather it be with things you just started from seed or plants you just bought? If you lost something or the bugs get it or you have any problems or you have to use pesticides, organic pesticides, folks. Would you rather it be on a small plant that you have nothing invested in really other than what it took you to get that plant to that size? Whether you went to the store and bought it or you had just started it from seed and got it up to this point. Or would you rather it get wiped out when the plant's fully grown and it's flushing out fruit and you have all these months invested in it and that's when it gets hit and wiped out with stuff. So if what I'm telling you is on either end of our seasons is stuff that's going to kill your plants. And in the middle, they're going to be really, really happy. I would err on the side of the beginning and dealing with issues then, then planting right on time and dealing with more stuff when the plants are bigger. I mean, just in sheer volume of how much, like if you're going to use a BT or an neem oil or something, you're going to use way less on smaller plants like if, than if you have big mature plants. Also, if you've been harvesting the entire season while the weather's really nice, when those problems do show up, it's way easier for you to just call it quits and rip the stuff out than it is when the stuff has just started producing. Okay, so get your stuff in early. If you're wrong about it, it's better to err on the side of early than to be right about it and end up being late. Okay, so that's my, um, so you had another question, strawberries. So strawberry season, if, uh, if you're new to the area, strawberry season is in March, I think, beginning of March. So that's our peak strawberry season. Um, all the farmers and suppliers get their bare root strawberries in somewhere between the second week of September through the second week of October. So here in another couple weeks, that's all people are going to be talking about is strawberries, 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 strawberries. So basically, as soon as everybody's talking about strawberries, then um, get, get your strawberries and get them planted. Starting bare root strawberry plants can be a little bit of a challenge, but they're so cheap. It's kind of like the seed story. Might as well, you know, spend 18, 20 bucks on 25 plants and kill them. Because if you can figure that out, you'll save tons of money. Because about two weeks to five weeks after that, the strawberry plants will start becoming available. So the bare roots are available first and the strawberry plants are available after that. I know for us, we sell our strawberry plants for $5 each. So $12 to $18 for 25 bare root strawberry plants or $5 for each strawberry plant that's already started. You do the math. So, and it comes before the plants are even available. So give it a shot. If you mess it up, then you can spend your money on plants. If you figure it out on some, you know, maybe, maybe like sort of figure it out this year and by next year you got it down pat, then you're going to be in a way better situation because um, you already got it figured out, then if just right out of the gate, you, um... oh, that's funny. Florida Farm Finder says if you got, yeah, buy 50. 
You're going to kill 25 by 50. And then Michael Thorne asked me, is it too late for Kalaloo? Mm, it depends on how warm our wet our winter is. Um, if you're going to plant Kalaloo now, put it in full, 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 full sun. As much sun as it can get. And then pay attention to what's in the southern sky and make sure as that sun gets lower in the sky, it's not going to get, you know, some shade from a shed or your neighbor's tree or something like that. So it needs full sun, um, and then they'll be way more uh, cold tolerant over the winter time. So if it's getting cool and with the days getting short, um, you put it in a spot that seems bright because it's a leafy green that gets dappled light. Um, it's going to be too many stresses for it. Um, as the days get shorter, it does seed a lot faster. So you'll end up with smaller plants, more seedy plants. Um, but no, I mean, typically I've grown it all, all winter in, in certain spots, but I've got so many other greens that we grow from now all the way through when it's time to really plant Kalaloo again. Um, that's one of the reasons why I like having these different types of the same vegetables so leafy greens that taste like spinach and then actual spinach that likes the cold because i don't have to fight the seasons i just roll with whatever season's coming up and plant that stuff during that season um but yeah it'll survive over the winter time i mean it's delicious don't get me wrong but um we got a lot of other really exciting greens i'll tell you what this um this perpetual spinach is absolutely amazing it's a type of swiss chard and instead of like coming out of one growth node, it'll start pushing out from many, many growth nodes. So you get a lot of the smaller leaves, which I think taste better anyway. And it does have a little bit of a spinachy flavor. Um, it still has that charred flavor, though. So if you absolutely hate chard, you're not going to like this. But um, this is a great green to have. Um, and they get huge. They get really big and, and are very, very productive plants. Um, so that's it, guys. This is really exciting. Um, I don't know about you guys, but... It feels to me like the longest months of the year are August and September. I don't know if it's because, you know, it's like we're almost there. Like, like fall's right there. The nicer weather's right there. But it always seems to me like these months really drag on. Um, but we're getting prepared. We're getting ready for fall. Um, you know, if you um, if you don't have your garden ready yet, don't don't stress out. Um, maybe start trying to get some seed trays and some potting mix and start experimenting with getting some seeds started. Um, but, you know, don't skip the beginning steps. Get those noxious weeds out of your garden area. Uh, get Figure out whatever you're going to figure out for getting water to your garden bed. You know, whether it's running a new pipe so your hose is a little closer you know, this, this time of year, like right now, is not a huge rush to get everything planted. We have a long fall, winter, spring season in front of us. Um, the only thing that might happen is if you're a little bit late, you might be late for one specific thing. So, like, you might be late to plant tomatoes by seed, right? But between right now and February you could plant a kick-ass garden of stuff that you're going to eat and you're going to really enjoy. So, you know, it's if you have work to do, you need to turn your soil or get your organic matter out or whatever, focus on that right now. Don't try and, like, just go nuts out because we're all talking about our fall gardens and feeling like you're behind. Um, because that prep work, kind of sets the tone for your entire garden. So we've started all of my school garden contracts and these poor kids are out there in the heat right now, you know, wheelbarrowing new soil into the garden beds and putting down the new organic fertilizers and pulling the weeds in the pathways and putting down fresh mulch. You know, we're getting ready for the season. If the first thing I did was run in there and just plant, man, we'd be dealing with nut sedge we wouldn't have as good of a crop so the base foundation of your garden is way more important you know in fact i think it's almost the only thing that's important because if that's where your focus is man once you get those plants in the ground they kind of take care of themselves i mean really for the most part if your timing is decent and you take care of your soil 
and you take care of your soil microbes, and you make sure all that good stuff is in there that you know that your plants need for the upcoming season, and you've done a great job pulling those weeds, you're gonna have a great season with a lot less hassle. If you just try and jump into it and get a bunch of stuff uh, planted, then you're gonna have your work cut out for you. Having a garden is gonna be a chore. It's gonna be a lot of work. You're not just gonna go out in your garden and enjoy the harvest and enjoy your garden. You're gonna be working the whole time. So put all your work in the front end and then enjoy the season. So with that, if you can't tune in live, please send me an email to info at witwalmorganics.com. If you have a garden topic that you want me to cover or a garden question, and you can't get in here in the live chat to ask me. Listen, if you got something cool going on in the gardening world or in the um, you know food security world, please hit me up. I would love to have you on my show. Um, and that's it. Thanks, everybody, for uh, tuning in and watching. And I hope you guys all have a great night. Peace.